I'm so thankful to be with all of you today. Happy to have another opportunity to share another portion of God's Word. It's always a great delight to study God's Word and to be able to share it. And uh, I'd like to continue with some do's and don'ts that we've been uh, studying about uh, every few weeks. And we looked at the uh, uh, do's and don'ts in the Ten Commandments and looked at we're not to uh, have any other God before God and uh, we're not to uh, make any graven image that uh, you no know, idols are to be in our hearts and uh, in our worship. And the third commandment also talks about the honor of God. And it was an excellent selection of a song to sing to introduce the lesson that God's name should be exalted in our, in our hearts and in our words. Uh, we should always speak of God uh, respectfully. Uh, the third commandment in the Ten Commandments is do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And we want to examine that commandment and the different things that would fall uh, under that as far as a prohibition. Uh, in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And of course, it's repeated again, the same commandment. In Deuteronomy 5 and verse 11, when Moses gives the law a second time there in Deuteronomy before they enter into the promised land, to, uh, to take the Lord's name in vain is surely going to be punished by God when we uh, use his name in a disrespectful way and uh, that we represent him in a way that is dishonorable or profane. In vain or for vanity is this uh, shav, there's the word there in Hebrew. It means emptiness or vanity is the basic meaning of the word. And of course, in this context, to take up God's name to no good purpose, emptiness of speech, uh, falsely or lying, it is translated a number of times, as we'll see, that it's um, you know just not treating God's name in the exalted way that it should be treated in our hearts and words. The dictionary says about treating God's name in vain, says use his name in a way that shows a lack of respect. So in any way that we use God's name in a disrespectful way, it is not going to go unpunished. It's a sin, a serious sin. A person's name, of course, is closely associated with the person who bears it. So when you're talking about God's name, that represents his person, his nature. And uh, to misuse his name is to misuse him. And if a person is uh, using that name wrongly, you're using God wrongly. And so we need to always conduct ourselves in such a way that we're going to exalt God. In looking at taking his name in vain, it's used to take his name lightly, falsely, flippantly, would also be included in this commandment. It forbids especially oaths and swearing by God's name and not keeping your vow or, or using the name of God in an oath in order to deceive. That is certainly one of the main ways in which one would take God's name in vain. In Leviticus 19, 12, you shall not swear falsely by my name. So as to profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. So if you take an oath, and how many people put their hand on the Bible and take an oath to uh, what a politician to defend the Constitution, and then they do things they know are unconstitutional after they get in office? Isn't that treating the Lord's name in vain? Or uh, you stand up on your wedding day and you, in the presence of God and these witnesses, I will stay with this person till death do us part, for better, for worse. Is that taking the Lord's name in vain if you don't do the things that you uh, made those vows to do? So when uh, there are many ways in which this passage uh, can be violated and that uh, we can apply it in a practical way to our life and see are we falling short on what this commandment says prohibits all use of God's name for vain, unworthy objects. You would not connect the name of God with idols or any man-made religion, attach God's name to it. Uh, I think about passages in the book of Ezekiel where false prophets would stand up and say, thus says the Lord, 
when the Lord has not spoken. And that's certainly using his name with error when you do that. So uh, any kind of unworthy object that you put God's name on, he tells them about a prophet has a dream. He says he could tell his dream, but I didn't send the dream. So don't get up and say, God gave me this dream. That's taking his name out of place and applying it to something he has nothing to do with. It forbids to showing disrespect for God's name, profaning it. Uh, it forbids us from using it to support untruth or lying or witchcraft or conjuring to associate God's name with that in any way is to treat his name in vain. And it forbids us wearing God's name and then being evil and disobedient. And we'll look at uh, passages about all these different uses of the idea of treating God's name in vain. You, you wear the name of uh, Christ and then you go out and misbehave in front of people. It causes people to think less of the gospel and less of the God that we serve and the Lord that we serve. If we're supposed to represent Jesus Christ, and we don't uh, exalt his name by the way we live and act. So all of those things would associate God's name with evil and cause people to blaspheme God. So in vain or vanity. You can see this idea of shav there uh, used with emptiness or vanity or emptiness of speech. I, I looked this up in the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew concordance, you know, other places where this word not use the Lord's name in vain is used. And you can see it there in, in Isaiah 59 and verse 4 that it is translated lies. It says no one uh, sues righteously and no one pleads honestly. They trust in confusion and speak lies or vanity, speak in vain. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Hosea 10 and verse 4 uh, they speak mere words with worthless oaths uh, or vain oaths. They, they take their oaths vainly. They uh, make covenants and judgment sprouts like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. In Exodus 23, 1, the same word is used. You shall not bear a false report. And you can see it associated with the telling of lies and using God's name and associating uh, yourself as a as a servant of God and yet telling lies. Can you see how that profanes God's name? Do not join your hands with the wicked man to be a mischief witness, mischievous or malicious witness. In Job 31, five, if I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hastened after deceit, falsehood is vanity, emptiness when it comes to words because they're not the truth. You can use the God's name in an idol uh, useless, flippant, uh, ir irreverent utterances of the name of God would all be forbidden. Uh, we sang about let the name of God be exalted. That's what we want. High above every name. You don't, wouldn't use it as just some common term. It always should be spoken with respect. And we can see in, in Psalms 60 and verse 11, again, this word vain. Oh, give us help against the adversary for deliverance by a man is vain. It, it's empty, worthless to put your trust in men to deliver. We put our trust in God to be our rock and deliverer. In Psalms 108 and verse 12, oh, give us help against the adversary for the deliverance by man is in vain. In my, Malachi 3 and verse 14, you have said it is, in it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his charge and that we have walked in the morning before the Lord of hosts. They say it's just worthless, empty to serve God was what some people were saying in Malachi's day. Uh, we don't get these physical rewards we thought we were going to get. Well, they really weren't serving the Lord like they should is what Malachi shows us. Doesn't? So we stay away from all use of God's name in this shallow, empty way is the idea behind the word without respect or thought about God when you're using the word. And our society is full of this kind of use of God's name. If you go online, you see it used in colloquial speech uh, among English-speaking people, and I get the idea that was probably going on back in the time that the Ten Commandments were given. You know, people don't change. People uh, take sacred things and use them in a 
profane way. It's been going on forever. And he says, uh, you'll not go unpunished if you use God's name that way. Uh, we see the OMG, oh my God, just throwing it out there in connection with anything using the name of God. No, God's name is to be exalted and, and spoken with reverence and with a purpose of exalting him whenever you mention his name. People will use the name uh, as, a, as a curse. Jesus Christ this and that. They hit their finger with a hammer or whatever and speak just in a common way and misuse and disrespect the name of God. And Christians need to set the proper example for all their friends and everybody we come in contact with that God's name is to be exalted and hallowed. And that's the way we treat the name of God because of his nature and who he is far above any of us. He's holy, holy, holy. The Greek Old Testament, when they're translating this word and just trying again to understand, don't use the Lord's name in vain. They confirm this meaning of being, you know, treating it in a worthless way or idle way or foolish way, the name of God. They, they translate the phrase epi Matayo in uh, the Greek where it has vain in the Hebrew. It says for something worthless, idle, foolish, trifling. In Isaiah or, or in Psalms 139 and verse 20, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Well, there's another passage where it actually says that exact phrase, doesn't it? And it talks about enemy nations and enemy people taking up the name of God and speaking in a disrespectful way. And, of course, we have people all around us speaking about God's name that way, don't we? They take up God's name, but they use it in vain. They don't use it with respect. They use it in this frivolous, trifling way. So it condemns all cursing and slang that is so popular among uh, wicked, uh, ungodly people. And in no way should uh, we let any worthless words like that proceed from our mouth. But we need to guard our mouths and our words and make sure we speak in a way that honors God. In Psalms 19 and verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That should be the prayer that we offer up to God when we think about God's name. We want God to be pleased and accepted in the way we think about God. That's where it all starts. The words that we speak on our mouth, we want those to glorify God. We want everything about our life to be acceptable to him. So don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Use God's name in swearing to the truth was the proper way that Israel was to use God's name in an oath. Yeah, they were to uh, confirm their oaths by God's name. They were going to need to confirm it in some way and making a covenant with somebody or whatever. You don't swear by idols. You don't swear by other things. You swear by God that you're, he oversee this covenant that's being made and these words and these promises. In Leviticus 19, 12, you shall not swear falsely by my name so as to profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. So, again, this is especially maybe the, the central idea of the commandment is you, if you're going to use God's name, you keep your word and you don't dishonor his name by swearing falsely. In Jeremiah 4 and verse 2, and you will swear as the Lord lives. And how do you swear if you're going to use God's name? In truth, in justice, and in righteousness. Then the nations will bless themselves in him, and in him they will glory. So if you're going to take an oath in God's name, you better do it in truth and justice and righteousness. You don't use God's name in vain. You use it only for uh, confirming what is true and just and righteous. In 2 Samuel, you can see the way they would take this kind of oath. Um, Abner and the Israelites uh, that had been a part of Saul's you know, family and kingdom, David's servants were fighting against them and uh, defeating them. And 
uh, Joab just kept pursuing them. And, you know, he said, are you just going to pursue your brothers until they're all gone? You know, is what Abner says to him. And then Joab said, as the Lord lives, so God is the witness. If you had not spoken, surely then the people would have gone away in the morning, each from following his brother. So this battle would have went on all night, you know, if we had, if you hadn't spoke up. May the, as the Lord lives, uh, this is true. So don't swear, we're told in the New Testament, in talking about uh, taking oaths, that we, we should not take oaths um, by any created thing uh, to try to, you know, say that what, to confirm that what we're saying is the truth. Uh, by the time of the New Testament, they had this idea about God's name, that you would only speak the name of God, only the high priest once a year would speak the name of God. And so the actual pronunciation of God's name that's in the Old Testament, people don't even know how to pronounce it. Some say, well, they translated it Jehovah, or some say it's Yahweh. But we really don't know exactly what vowel, it's just four consonants put together. We don't know where to put the vowels and don't know exactly how to pronounce his name. So they thought, well, we speak so respectfully of God, but then they would swear by other things. <laughs> and they, they had all of these rules about if you swear by certain things, then you've got to keep your word. But if you swear by other things, you're not bound to tell the truth. And Jesus is saying, your righteousness as a Christian and as a disciple of Christ has got to go way beyond the scribes and Pharisees and these rules that they come up with to lie. You can't do that as a Christian. When you speak, it should be anytime you say yes, it means yes, and no means no, that you're honest all the time. It says, but I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond this is of evil. So there shouldn't be any of these oaths that you make and swearing like this. He's not talking about you can't swear in court by God's name. He didn't mention God in that in the sense of swearing by God's name when you're confirming a truth in court or in, in a covenant or to settle some dispute. But he's talking about these kind of oaths where you're swearing by these earthly created things and thinking you can get away with lying. That's the kind of oaths he's talking about. He says any kind of oath you take, everything goes back to God. So you better just tell the truth. That's the point. Always tell the truth. And don't use these frivolous things to swear by in order to deceive. James says the same thing in the, gospel, in the book of James. But above all, my brethren, do not swear. And then he tells the type of swearing that we shouldn't do, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. So always speak the truth. And you don't need to take all these stupid oaths, right? They don't do that. Don't swear in everyday conversation. Treat the Lord's name as holy. It should only be used in the most, you know, important situation that you would bring up God's name. You should just have a reputation when you say something, people believe you because you don't lie. It's not forbidding the using of God's name in court or to settle controversy. The New Testament talks about that, and we see the apostles using God's name to confirm their word as being true. And if the apostles do it, isn't that an approved example that we, we could do that too in the proper context? Treating God's name with respect, using it in the right way. In Matthew 26, 63 and 64, but Jesus kept silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you, which means I put you under oath. <laughs> and Jesus didn't object to being put under oath before God. I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, after you, 
Afterwards, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right end of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So I'm putting you under oath by God's name. Tell us. And Jesus told him exactly the truth. He said, you said it. I am the Christ. And I am coming with power. I'm going to be, it's going to be an irresistible judgment that he's going to bring when he comes on the clouds to destroy that uh, city and that temple and, and that priesthood. In 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 23, Paul had been accused of being uh, frivolous about his word and saying things yes and no at the same time or whatever. And Paul is showing, no, I always tell the truth. I said I was coming to see you. But circumstances were such, I found out from Titus, that it was best for me to delay my trip. So instead of coming straight across the Aegean Sea to Corinth, he decided to take the long route around to give them time to repent. And in the midst of that, he calls God as a witness to his honesty. But I call God as witness to my soul that to spare you, I did not come again to Corinth. And he says the same kind of an oath in... Uh, the book of Romans and Romans 1 9 and in Philippians 1 8 he calls God to witness to the truthfulness of what he teaches and his uh, his attitude in pre presenting the gospel in Galatians 1 20 he says to the Galatians now in what I am writing to you I assure you before God that I am not lying well, he uses God's name there but he uses it in a proper way God's knows my heart he knows my life and i'm telling you the truth before him in first thessalonians 5 27 i adjure you by the lord to have this letter read to all the brethren i put you under oath before god make sure everybody hears this book you don't keep it to yourself you read it to everybody in the book of revelation there's an angel that stands up and raises his hand and takes an oath before god of that what he's saying is true. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. So simply tell the truth. Speak the truth in love. Don't, don't uh, have any lying lips. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. And uh, only swear by God's name on the, in, in the most important situations. And treating God's name holy is the positive way to take this commandment. <laughs> don't treat his name in vain is the negative way, right? The positive way is to treat God's name holy. <laughs> Exalt his name. Hallow his name. And the New Testament repeats that idea of having respect for the name of God um, in Jesus teaching us about prayer. In Psalms 111 and verse 9, he has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. That ought to be the attitude we're living with every day. God's name is awesome and holy. And we always treat it with the highest respect possible. When we offer up a prayer, we, we begin our prayers by praising God's name and adoring his name. Uh, Jesus said to pray like this, hallowed be your name, the way to start a prayer. Now, there's a lot of other ways to express that same thought. And we don't see another prayer in the New Testament that starts off, hallowed be thy name. They say, you know, you who know all hearts and the creator of all things or some way or another, you exalt God in your prayer and uh, hold his name up. And your desire uh, is that everybody treat God's name that way. Hallowed be thy name. The word hallowed uh, in Greek there is to render or acknowledge, to be venerable, to hollow, to treat as holy, speak of reverently and with respect. And that's, that's what we want to do when we pray. And we want, we're, it's our desire that everybody would treat God's name as holy. Holy means different or separate, absolutely unique, pure from every fault is our God. And 
immaculate. There's no uh, error in, no darkness in God. He is all light. He's all purity. He's all holiness. Totally righteous. That's the God who we, we treat his name that way because that's what he is. But you keep that commandment positively by habitually using the name of God in the right way. Can you see how if you do what Jesus teaches there and you pray that way and you mean it, that you would never use God's name in the wrong way. If your whole purpose is to exalt his name, you'd never use it in vain. You'd make sure that you don't. The name uh, should be confined to teaching about God, like we're doing right now, or praying to God, or praising God, or giving thanks to God. That's the way to use his name. It's the way that exalts and shows respect for God. So any vain, irreverent use of God's name or uh, titles, it's a very sinful thing to do. And it's good for us to think deeply about what the law of God reveals. And of course, this is, you can see it's repeated in the New Testament, this idea of always treating uh, sacred things very seriously, whether it's uh, God's church, the work of the church, the worship of the church, God's servants in the church, anything attached to his name, we better treat it with deep respect. Wearing God's name and disobeying is a way to treat God's name in vain, as we mentioned when we were looking at the introduction to the lesson. Look what happened when the Israelites became wicked and they got carried away into captivity to foreign lands. How do you think that made God's name look? Here are the God's special people, and they're so wicked, God has allowed them to be defeated and taken to Babylon. What do the other nations think about them now in God? It's, they're not going to think much of God, right? So he shows that is to treat his name in a profane way, the way they've lived and acted. When they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have counted, uh, they have come out of his land. These are the people of his, look, look, the way, look the, what happened to them because of their disobedience. Their God didn't protect them. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 24, it talks about, you know, all of the Gentiles have sinned, and then it turns to the Jews and to those that are feel morally superior to other people. And he points out that all of these legalists, they're also sinners. The Jews were sinners. They violated God's law. And what did it do when they violated God's law? It made people look down on the God they serve. So it says, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Just as it is written, you say, oh, the law is great, and then you don't keep the law? God's law is great, and you don't respect it? Well, it shows you don't respect your God much, <laughs> You're, or he's not worthy of respect when you look at his servants and they don't keep his law. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 1, all who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. So there it mentions the name of God, doesn't it? That's the, you, you're profaning God's name as a servant and you're disobedient to your master. It makes them look down on the God, uh, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and his doctrine, that it would teach people that are Christians to be rebellious to authority that's over them. Now, we're to show people that we submit to authority because of the ultimate authority. We follow the rules. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So all of us, if we're going to keep that third commandment, we need to live excellent lives before the people of the world that are around us. We want them to look at our behavior that the gospel has taught us to have. Our God has instructed us in that Jesus set the example for us. And when they see the way we behave, 
even though there's been lots of lies told about the church and about his people, when they, they, they live around you and see you, they will glorify a God that teaches people to have holy lives and to act in a righteous way, that it'll bring glory to God. That's what we're trying to bring. So we want to make sure not only, you know, we keep the letter of that law and saying, well, I never swear falsely in God's name. It goes a lot deeper than that, doesn't it? It goes to everything about you. You want to exalt the name of God in the way that you behave. Well, brethren, I hope this lesson will be uh, encouragement to all of us to redouble our efforts to represent our God and his doctrine in the proper way in our lives and always use our lips to praise him. Always have our thoughts pure when we think about God and his nature. If you'll bow with me, we'll go to our Heavenly Father in prayer and be dismissed to our classes.